Let's go to Mark chapter 2, verse 3 through 12. I'm going to try to be very short and brief so you can go to Chick-fil-A, amen, and get your chicken sandwich. Oh, they cook. funny they, they got me enough for both services <laughs> four, four, four men came to Jesus carrying a man who could not move his body before I do that I, I just want to acknowledge your worship team and your music team can we clap our hands for them amen come on we could do better than that they just rocked that they look good come on we gotta celebrate our own four, four men came to Jesus carrying a man who could not move his body these men could not get near Jesus because of so many people. They made a hole in the roof of the house over where Jesus stood. Then they let down the bed with the sick man on it. When Jesus saw their faith, underline that if you have your own Bible. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the sick man, son, your sins are forgiven. Some teachers of the law were sitting there. They thought to themselves, why does this man talk like this? He is speaking as if he is God. Who can forgive sins? Only one can only one can forgive sins, and that is God. Verse 8, and once Jesus knew the teachers of the law were thinking this, he said to them, why do you think this is your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the sick man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your bed, and start to walk. I am doing this so you may know the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the sick man who could not move his body, I say to you, get up, take your bed, and go home. At once, the sick man got up. He took his bed. He went home. Everybody saw him. They were all surprised and wondered about it. They thanked God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. I want to give this teaching a title. Let's call it Don't Accept No. Would you say that with me? Don't accept no. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, here's your preaching opportunity right here. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, don't accept no for an answer. Jerry Seinfeld was fired after a poor performance on his very minor role on the sitcom Benson. You'd have to be old enough to know about Benson. No one told him, no one told him, to uh, show up to what they call a table read. When you're in acting, before you do a scene, they have what they call a table read. He did not know that he was fired until he got to the table read, and they began to read through the script, and he realized that his part was no longer in the script. Out of at least 35 iconic TV shows, one of the most watched and beloved TV shows in the 90s was The Seinfeld Show. In total syndication, the show has reportedly made more than $3 billion dollars. In profit. Oprah was fired from one of her first jobs as a broadcaster. She was too attached to the stories they told her. They said, you get too emotional when you begin to talk about the people. And for that reason, that's not going to work for television. Well, we know how that turned out. <laughs> She's worth, it's one of the few black women in America that's worth over billions of dollars. Bill Gates dropped out of Harvard started a new business which flopped. He tried his hand at another business venture, and Microsoft was born. To date, he's worth over $105 billion. The reason why I bring these people's attention to your, bring these people to your attention today is because they all had something in common. They were willing to say yes to the dream of their purpose. And my question to you today is what are you continuously saying no to that God is telling you to say yes to. Church, God wants to use your yes. In this season, God is looking for some kingdom, kingdom builders. Come on, say amen. amen. God is looking for some people that will be sold out to the call of, uh, call of Christ. And so let's talk about what your yes means. Write it down. Your yes is your agreement to God's will for your life. Somebody say yes. When you say yes, what you're doing is you're entering a contract, a spiritual contract with God, and you're saying, I'm willing 
to be obedient to the process that you have for me so that I can receive the promise that is mine. I want you to understand that the promise is already yours. Somebody say it's already mine. That part of it is no, you don't have to worry about that. That's a done deal. Where the challenge is going to be is if you're willing to endure the process in order to see the manifestation of the promise. Let's go to Luke chapter 9, verse 23. It says, then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciples must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. Question becomes, are you doing what you want to do, or are you doing what God has called you to do? Yes is our dedication to our assignment. Yes is our dedication to our assignment. Dedication is the quality of being committed to a task or a purpose. A lot of people say that they have dedication but they're not committed. A lot of people say they're committed, but there's no quality to the commitment. And here's what I mean by that. You say, well, at least I'm here. Attitude. <laughs> Mumbling. This became a Presbyterian church real fast. <laughs> this, we was like, this is, I start preaching. Everybody, mm. When we say we're committed, we need to be committed with quality. What does that mean? Prepare, for, prepare before you get up on stage. Prepare, prepare before you go out there and serve the people. The ushers should be practicing. The greeters should have time of practice. Let's talk to the leaders for a second. Leaders, you're not, leader, you're not leading if you don't have a team. You're just holding a title. When you're leading, you should be able to turn around and there should be some people behind you. And then those people behind you should feel like they are growing because you are growing. So leaders, you have to make sure that you're producing quality and that you, are, you yourself are receiving quality. Now, I know the first thing you want to do when we start talking like this, you want to start blaming the pastor and everybody else, right? Because it's their responsibility of why you don't have quality. No, sir. It is your responsibility to make sure that you have quality. Amen. So here's what's going to happen today. What's going to happen today is what happens in all services. The power of God is going to fall. The anointing will flow. The message will go forth. One person, uh, two people will sit by each other. One person is going to get exactly what they need. They're going to get set free. They're going to take it to the next level. You see them next year around this time, they done gone to a whole new level. The other person sitting there next to them going to be in the same exact spot. Let me get back behind the point. Where the piano guy went? Play, play softly so we can... <laughs> there you go. Luke chapter 9, verse 62 says, No one puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This is Jesus speaking to a man about his promise when it's time for him to say goodbye to his family. Write this down. Yes is our commitment to the process. Yes is our commitment to the process of the, of the purpose. I was, I was kidding, uh, my brother. <laughs> you don't have to put... Yes, is our commitment to the process of the problem. All right, so let's talk about our text today. When you want to know anything about Jesus, you go to the Gospels, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are your four Gospels. I'm giving you a quick little Bible uh, theology 101, all right? Of the four Gospels, Mark is the shortest Gospel in uh, the collection of them all. The book of Mark is an action book. Mark shows Jesus constantly in action. When you read the book of Mark and he describes Jesus, he shows Jesus as an active God or he shows Jesus as a God doing something. In other words, Jesus was always about his business. Jesus was always doing something. Be careful of Christians and people that say they're waiting. <laughs> I don't even like songs that talk about waiting. I don't mind waiting. Waiting on what? God's waiting on you. You've been out there at the club. You've been out there fooling around. You've been out there cutting up for years. You just got here six months ago, and now you're talking about you waiting. Nah, bro, we've been waiting on you for 30 years. And then got the nerve to talk about you tired. You just started. Mark shows Jesus doing something. Mark speaks about the action Jesus. He speaks about the Jesus working. He speaks about the Jesus being busy on his mission. And what, is, what was his mission? His mission was to save the lost. His mission was to heal the sick. And his mission was to make disciples. I'm going to give those to you again so you can understand what our mission should be. To save the lost. To heal the sick. 
and to make disciples. If you are not winning people to Jesus, I question if you are a real Christian. Part of your Christian assignment is to win the lost. That is not a, you know, an ordained licensed minister thing. That is a Christian thing. That is the assignment of every believer, every disciple. So when you go to the restaurant today and you order, well, not Chick-fil-A, amen. Uh, where y'all go eat at? Golden Corral, that's a nasty. Y'all got Golden Corral? My God. Let me give you some money so you can do better, amen. <laughs> Glory to God. All right. Well, I'm joking. I'm joking. All right. Y'all go to Golden Corral. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Them buffets, all you can eat. If I sneezing and coughing over that stuff, go ahead. <laughs> get the oil. I'll pray for you now so you don't get sick. Amen. <laughs> when you go out amongst the public and the waitress and what uh, 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 serves you your bill, make sure you let her know Jesus loves you. Make sure you let her know your testimony of what God can do for you. Some of you have been watering down your testimony. That's not a testimony. What you need to do is tell people what God has done for you. What you need to do is stop having amnesia and dementia and go ahead and act like you know exactly what time it is. You was out there. Don't make me go there. Don't make me go. That's a long time ago. No. A thousand years is as a day with the Lord. So. If I calculate, that was yesterday. You was out there dropping it like it was, amen. Come on, give me a hey or something. We have to tell our testimony because it brings breakthrough to others. We have to let people know we survived the broken heart. We have to let people know that we survived uh, possibly ODing numerous times. We have to let people know we survived uh, being a part of a, a, a criminal record. We have to let people know that we survived uh, being a weed smoker and, and drinking people under the table and being the best drunk driver there ever lived. Now I done got quiet. Y'all might be in trouble today. I might come right down your road. I'm telling you right now. After you get a certain age, you don't care no more. You just go to telling people the truth. I'm tired. I ain't come here to play around and talk about no shat rat, me shack, and a bingo. I'm talking about me, you, and the rest of us that's in here. Is there anybody that can clap their hands and say, God brought me out of some mess? God brought me out of hell. God brought me out of depression. I almost lost my life three times, but I thank God. That I'm not ashamed. Somebody give me a hey. It's important for us to understand that we have to heal the sick. And that's not just physical, but sometimes that's mental. One of the biggest issues we have right now is mental illness. And it's in the church. People are depressed. People are anxiety filled. You have a stress level through the roof and that's not because it's in your family. It's because you're just worrying too much. And it's important for you to understand that you have to be careful what you speak. You can speak yourself into high blood pressure. Come on and preach with this black man today. Say amen or something. You can speak yourself into a stroke. Come on church. So you have to be careful what you're saying. Old folks used to say, if you ain't got nothing good to say, sh <laughs> God wants to heal us of fear. God wants to heal us of bipolar. God wants to heal us of dementia. God wants to heal us of suicidal thoughts. You ready? Some of you don't even realize this, but, but some of you have given up your confidence. My old church, when I was coming up as a young preacher, y'all don't know, y'all don't know church. He be, my old pastor used to be in the height of preaching. I'm talking organ tuning, and by this time the church is a few thousand, so it's a lot of people, you know what I mean? It's an intimidating crowd, and crowd is going crazy. He'd be right in the middle of preaching. I promise you, he'd turn around and look, and he'd throw the mic right at you. 
preach. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> It taught us how to be ready. It taught us how to overcome our fears. It taught us how to get our confidence. And see, church, I'm telling you right now, the problem with the church and the reason why we can't go higher in our services is all of us coming in here looking for somebody to lift us up. All of us coming in here looking for a word to take us to the next level. All of us coming in here looking for somebody to sing. us. We got to sing about 20 songs before we can get one clap out of you. Over here, busting a vein, about to have a migraine headache just to get a rock from your big head. Play softly, bro. What brother? No, 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 I'm talking. <laughs> what if you changed the game that by next Sunday, when Pastor Georgina and, and, and Pastor Al come back, you come in here with a praise on your lips? What if you walked in this place? with a preach word already in your belly. What if you came in here with your own worship? Don't need one song, don't need one instrument, don't need nobody to pump you up, stir you up, or get you up. What if you walk in here with an anointing that could set every person free? What if you walked in here and just prayed with somebody and they fell out in the spirit in the parking lot? I don't hear nobody. What if you brought your own anointing? Church God can do it. He is no respecter of person. All he needs is a yes. I just need one hand up right now and tell God yes. One hand. Say, God, I, I give you my yes. Come on, say it right now. God, I give you my yes. Nah, we want to know what that yes means. What comes with that yes? No, nah, don't worry about what comes with the yes. If you trust God, it don't matter. Jesus, have mercy. Half of us are a miracle anyway. It's a miracle. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, it's a miracle I'm alive today. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It's a miracle I'm in church today. I don't hear nobody. Hey, glory. I feel the anointing. I mean, it's a miracle I'm in my right mind today. I need a praise in church right here. I mean, it's a miracle that I'm a preacher today. I don't hear nobody. I need a praise in church right here. It's a miracle that I know the Lord, that I'm in church, that I want to serve him, that I'm doing right, that I got good morals in my life. Slap three people, tell them it's a miracle. You sitting next to a miracle. Jesus is teaching in this little house. And as he's teaching in this little house, he begins to find the place to be completely packed out with Pharisees. It's one thing to have people around you that like your preaching. It's a whole different thing to have a bunch of people in there just skeptical, looking down at you, acting like they better than you. You don't like me no way. What you come here for? I don't like this. Well, you don't come here. Go, go, go down. There's a lot of churches. Go, go somewhere else. Uh-oh, I shouldn't say that. Pastor, I'd be like, you running my people off? No, no, no. <laughs> he's in this house and he's preaching. There's a bunch of Pharisees. Listen to me, church. And the Pharisees have packed the house out. So now the people that really want to get to Jesus can't get to him. The people that know who he is, now listen to me, they knew he was God. They knew the healing power that he possessed. They knew the deliverance that he could do. They couldn't get to him. The Pharisees that didn't know, they were just there to judge. But it was a setup. David said it this way, God will prepare a table in the presence of your enemies. So for those of you that are being forced to work at some jobs where you got some people that you want to slap instead of pray for. For those of you that are working with some bosses right now that are always plotting, trying to kill the, the promotion that you're supposed to have, I want to say to you, stand there forth in the liberty wherewith Christ has set you free. And weeping may endure for a night, but get ready. This is your year of yes. Joy is getting ready to come in the morning. <laughs> Slap somebody, say, hang in there. And in the middle of this house where it's packed out with a bunch of naysayers, there are four friends that decided to bring their 
one friend, the fifth friend, who is lame and cannot walk, he's sick. We don't know particularly of what, but he's sick enough to where he can't walk. And they love him enough to bring his, I don't know how much he weighed, my God, but he was a grown man, so he had to weigh at least 150, 160 pounds. Last I checked, you know, half of us can't bench 160 pounds, but we certainly ain't going to sit there and try to carry it down the dusty road. It ain't like they had cars or Uber. So they're committed to bringing this grown man down to Jesus so he can get healed. And some of us can't put nobody in our car and bring them to church so that they can get breakthrough. Half of our car is out there, one person in there. I mean, the rest of your seats look like they're brand new because ain't nobody ever seen <laughs> Some of you got these houses that are just museums. You got certain rooms that are museums. Y'all know what I'm talking about. That means nobody never even be in them. Just sitting, look at my house. Look at my, God bless you to be a blessing. Did you know that? I don't know if they do life groups here, but if they do, you need to do one. All that house you got. <laughs> Amen. You need to take on a life. Well, Pastor, I'm not ready yet. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Just create the atmosphere for miracles. You'll be surprised. Some people just want to get some things off their chest. Just sit in a circle. And when you sit in a circle and just open the floor up and say, who's been feeling down or who's been struggling? You'll find out somebody will say, hey, listen, I was like that last week, but here's what I did. And God brought me breakthrough. And another person will say, I'm glad you shared that with me because I'm going through that very same thing right there. And before you know it, you'll walk out of that place with miracles. That's how easy it is. You ain't got to know uh, Shadrach, Meshach, the, and, and the, Lion, the Daniels and the, all the books of the Bible. You ain't got to be a the theologically astute and all that. Just give the opportunity for Jesus to work in your life. It is a whosoever will gospel, let him come. The Bible says Jesus is in there and he's uh, uh, preaching. And these friends could not get in. And because they could not get in, they go to the roof and they tear the roof off the place to let the friend down. This is not unusual for people to be on the roof of those type of houses. People used to sit on the people used to sleep on the roof if it was hot enough. There's no air conditioning. So sometimes people would have dinner on their roof. So being on the roof was not unusual. What is unusual is for, the, for them to go over there and tear up a, a complete stranger's house. <laughs> you got to know you heard from God to be tearing up somebody's house like that. But when we see this text, that tells us three specific things that I'm going to give to you, and then we're getting ready to pray. There are three elements of things you need to understand so that you don't continue to accept knowing your life. And I want you to write them down. Here's the first one. Find a work with me team. Get with people that are not going to give up on you. Get with folks that are willing to believe with you. Get some people that talk faith in your ear and not fear and not doubt. Proverbs 18, 24 says some friends pretend to be friends, but a true friend sticks closer than a brother. You need to begin to get some people in your life that's going to work with you. They know what you're going through. They know you have ups and downs. They know you have good days and bad days, but they're still willing to stand with you. And when you begin to understand that you got that kind of team, I'm telling you right now, you cannot lose. These friends were willing to work with this young man. And to get him where he needed to be. They didn't wait. To, there are certain people that will only be around you when you're healthy. But if you're sick, they don't want nothing to do with you. They'll only be around with you when you're winning. But when you're losing, they, they start distancing themselves. I like them kind of people that watch you on so, social media or take when you get the new house and whatnot. And then they come, you ain't heard from them in years. Hey, brother, I see your church popping off. How you doing? Find people that will work with you in every season. That's what these four men represent. Secondly, connect with strong people. This is important. Some of you keep putting yourself around weak people. 
You are the strongest people in your group, and that's why you are going through so much hell right now. Find folks that can carry you when you can't carry yourself. People that know your weight and don't mind lifting your load. Because some days I'm heavy. Jesus, help us today. Some days I ain't got it. You, ever, you know what dead weight is? Some days you can't lift yourself. And when you can't lift yourself, find somebody that can lift you. A lot of people can't handle your baggage. And that's why you got to keep faking all the time. Uh, praise the Lord. And know you're going through. That's why you got to always be the one to pump everybody up. About to lose your mind. Because you know that if you let them know who you really are and what you're really going through, they couldn't handle it. And what these four men represented was that they were friends that were strong enough to carry his load, church. Ah, help me today, Jesus. Because I'm telling you right now, I know it got rough along the way when they were carrying him. And I don't know about you, but if I was one of the four, when I realized we couldn't get in the house, I think I probably would have said, bro, we tried. I carried you all the way down. I had every intention, but yo, we can't get in. It's a wrap. I'm sure somebody said that out of the four. But thank God that they talked themselves into enough faith to say, nah, we strong enough to get this brother. Come on, church. Up onto the roof. That's what ministry is. That's what church is. That's what pastoring is. Let me tell you something. Pastoring and ministry and a church is not about just giving somebody a quick thrill, but it's seeing people all the way through the finish line. That's what real ministry is. Let now, let, I was going to say let now church. Let victory outreach carry you. Stop running away when you're going down. That's the wrong thing to do. We are strong enough. I need a couple of people to go to clapping your hands right here. We are strong enough to carry you. Clap your hands right there. Clap your hands right there. Clap it until you feel it. Come on, I need some members. Clap your hands right there. I need some ministers. Let the people know we are strong enough to carry you. You don't have to be embarrassed at Victory Outreach if you've fallen off. Those of you that are sitting at home, I challenge you to get back in church. It's good to be home, but God ain't called you to no online service. God called you to be amongst the fellowship of the saints. And you need to feel the anointing that's in here. And you need to know that the church is strong enough to carry you. So don't let the enemy push you away in isolation and die alone. Thank God this young man was willing to let these four friends carry him all the way through and up over into the roof. Proverbs 17, 17, write it down. A friend shows his friendship at all times. It is for adversity that such is a brother is born. That's why God put them in your life. It's for those days when you are feeling like you're going to go back to your old ways. And church, trust me when I tell you, there's a thin thin curtain right there that separates you from all the sins you used to be a part of. And all that stuff is still there. People talk about midlife crisis. There's no midlife crisis. You have never, it is only the grace of God that gives you the strength to not be who you used to be. And I ain't going to charge you for this. That's why you don't judge people now that you're saved. And that's why you don't look down on people. And if you ain't never been like that, trust me, you probably got something. The songwriter said, a wretch, I was a wretch undone. I don't know what a wretch is, but I promise you I was one. <laughs> you don't need the details, but I can tell you I was a wretch. And Y'all laughing at me, but y'all was a wretch too. Glory to God. And for some of you that's sitting there looking at all of us down your nose, you probably was the biggest wretch. Glory to God. At least I got enough sense to know I was tore up from the flow up. Some of you done put, 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 put nice stuff over a bunch of mess. Got the, outer, got the outer looking right, but in the inside, you need to be on this altar. You need to be eating carpet right now. Oh, this is a real message today. 
It's a real message today. You won't even come to the altar because you don't want people to think bad about you. You are crazy. I wish I would worry about you. I'll roll on the floor if that's what, if whatever it takes. Tell your neighbor, whatever it takes. Don't go. Life happens one time, and it's very short. So don't sit here and spend a bunch of days in hell when you could have only just spent five minutes. Some of you is dealing with grief. The Holy Spirit is speaking to me. So you're dealing with grief. Don't play with grief. Grief will take you down a path and you almost it'll take you down a rabbit path. You'll never know how to get out of it. You got to release that thing. You got to release that loved one. You got to let that go. And you've got to keep going. Life goes on. Life is for the living. Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. So you, gotta, you can love your loved one, but you got to release them. Because that is not what they want you to do. That is not the love of God. That is, that, that is an evil spirit that will try to destroy your future and your destiny. You are still alive, and you owe it to that loved one to continue to live. Church, clap your hands right there. Clap your hands. Come on, in the back, clap your hands. Clap your hands. Stir up the gift of God. Stir up this atmosphere right now. Stir it up. Stir it up. Break that chain right now. I rebuke that spirit right now. Stir it up. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. There are miracles here. And God wants you to have that miracle today. Lift your hands in this building. Father, I thank you. We curse the curse right now. We will not tolerate depression in this place. We will not tolerate grief in this place. God's people's minds are free in the name of Jesus. We accept our healing. It is ours. For It's our portion. It's our right. It's our right. In the name of Jesus. Keep your hands lifted. God's giving you somebody to pray for. Pray for them right now. God's bringing somebody to your mind. It might be your grandmother. It might be an aunt, an uncle. It might be a brother or a sister. It might be a friend, co-worker. God's giving that, that person to you right now. Pray for them. Pray for them. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We thank you, Holy Spirit. I want to give you one more. Look for people that are looking for the same outcome as you. You need to start asking people, where are we going? And if y'all are going in two different places, it's time for you to get off that train. You say, Pastor, but I love that person. That's my best friend. That's my BFF. I say to you, love them from afar. It's okay to love people from afar. But you got to lock up and load with people that are serious about the gospel. If you're in here today, trust me when I tell you, God has called you to ministry. God has called you to ministry. And if you're not willing to accept that, then you're the person I came here for. It's time for you to say yes. And you've got to take a step of faith. And you've got to let God carry you. And then you've got to put yourself from this moment forward with people that are headed that way. If you've got people in your life that are not called to ministry, you need to stop hanging out with them. You mean I got to cut them off? No, I ain't saying you got to cut them off. I'm just telling you for this season right now, you need folks that are going towards ministry. You're in here today, say, Pastor, I'm ready to go to that next level. I'm ready to stop telling God no. I'm ready to stop saying maybe. I'm ready to stop being on the fence. I need something serious. I need a special, a unique spiritual transformation in my life when it comes to the spiritual matters in my life. I'm going to ask, when I count to three, I'm going to ask you to join me at this altar. I don't even want you to hesitate. I'm not talking about the usual religious thing. Listen to me carefully. I don't want you to even come here and stand. I want you to, those of you that can physically, I want you to kneel. I want you to find a place at this altar where you can pray. One, two, three. Make your way down. You've been saying no. You've been playing around. You know God has called you. You know there's a book you're supposed to have written. You know there's a business you're supposed to have started. Some of you are already in ministry. Some of you are on staff. Some of you are already in leadership. This ain't just for the people in the homes. This is for a lot of y'all that are playing games in here. And Pastor Al, them should not have to work as hard because there should be more people that are spiritually strong enough to carry the burden of Victory Outreach San Diego. 
But that cannot happen. That cannot happen if we play church and we never become the church. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I come in agreement with those that would take a step of faith and spend a little time. It doesn't take a long time. It just takes a step of faith. Father, I just thank you for those that will make their way to a holy altar and say, I'm ready to be healed completely. I'm ready to be set free completely by the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name. I thank you for transformation in Jesus' name. I thank you for deliverance in Jesus' name. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for that next level in Jesus' name. I'm praying for your confidence today. Hallelujah. I'm praying for a fresh touch of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I've been there. I know what it is to be in church and be dry. I know what it is to be in church and just fake and not have no power.